All right, welcome everyone. On behalf of the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for Atlanta and States' second quarterly electric vehicle webinar. My name is Kyle James, and I'm the Development and Outreach Coordinator at the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. For those of you not familiar with the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, we are a nonprofit organization that promotes responsible energy choices that work to address the impacts of global climate change and ensure clean, safe, and healthy communities throughout the Southeast. We are a membership organization, and we would like to acknowledge our members on this call and encourage those of you who are not members to please join us today. For ways in which you can become a member and get involved, please visit our website at www.cleanenergy.org. Now I'd like to take a moment to review the basic functions of the WebEx control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. To ensure sound quality, your attendees will all be muted throughout this presentation. So go ahead and find the three buttons along the top of your screen. And if you're having any trouble hearing or seeing the slides, click the blue chat button and type in your problem so I can help you. We do have time at the end of this presentation to answer any questions about today's topic. So to ask a question, click the question mark button along the top of your screen. Make sure all panelists is showing up in the drop-down menu, then type your question into the questions text box. We will do our best to answer the questions in the order that we receive them. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our program officer, Ann Blair, the Director for the Clean Fuels for the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. Ann? Thank you, Kyle, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you again to today's webinar about electric vehicle policies and incentives. This is the second in a webinar series for 2017 that SAFE is hosting with the City of Atlanta's Office of Resilience and the Electrification Coalition. As Kyle mentioned, I'm Ann Blair, the Director of Clean Fuels at the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, and I also have the privilege of being the current president of EV Club of the South. Transportation is now the number one source of CO2 emissions and our use of oil jeopardizes national security and is costing our environment. Electrification stands to benefit individual drivers and fleet managers who will save on fuel costs, communities in need of cleaner air, as well pro as provide grid benefits. Our cities and states can and are leading the way in supporting technology development and deployment. Today, we will begin by taking a local, state, and federal approach, highlighting case studies and opportunities ahead for EV policy. Here is an overview of our agenda today. If I can get the slide up, apologies. One moment, please. Kyle, could you check the advancement of the slides, please? Yeah, if you want to go ahead and just give me back the presenter duties, I can do that for you. Thank you. So here's an overview of our agenda today. We're going to start with introductions, followed by an overview of respective EV programs and initiatives. Uh, Justin is going to talk about the City of Atlanta's EV policies. Then I'm going to do an overview of Georgia's story, our current EV policies, and our his historical look. Then we're going to talk about federal, the Federal Tax Incentive for EVs, followed by some case studies from Colorado and the Group by Accelerator Communities. Last, we'll close with uh, and open it up for questions. Next slide, please. So today, we have three presenters, Justin Breitharp with the City of Atlanta and Electrification Coalition, myself with the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, and Natalia Swalnick with the Electrification Coalition. Great. Next slide, please. So first up, we have Justin Breitharp. He's with the City of Atlanta's Office of Resilience. He's a graduate of Georgia State University and has been with the Electrification Coalition and the City of Atlanta since last year. Justin. Thank you, Ann, for that introduction. Um, so as Ann mentioned, I'm Justin Breitharp with the Mayor's Office of Resilience and part of my, and I'm the alternative fuel 
vehicle technical advisor. So part of my job is to manage the city's um, fleet of alternative fuel vehicles as well as some policy initiatives. So just to give you some background of over the city of Atlanta, we currently have 65 electric vehicles in our municipal fleet, which makes us the largest municipal electric vehicle fleet in the state of Georgia. We currently have 42 level one and two charging stations with throughout the city limits and six of those will be available for public use and those will be coming online in the next couple of weeks. And so, um, and actually that bottom right picture will, is some examples of the uh, electric charging stations that are used by the city vehicles as well as the public. And so um, how this all came to be was the electrification coalition in the city of Atlanta formed an MOU where the electrification coalition provides policy and technical support for electric vehicles among other alternative fuel vehicles and also how my position came to be. And so, um, and currently we are trying to identify ways that we can be more supportive of EV policy, uh, not just at the state level, but also from a, a local city level. And so, uh, Kyle, if you go to the next slide, please. So one of the ways that um, we did that, it, or we're trying to do that, is an EV ready ordinance. So what that is, is we are trying to amend the electrical code where we will require new commercial construction to install conduit for future, future electric vehicle charging stations. And so commercial, build, commercial construction usually includes office buildings, retail, and multifamily housing. Um, we thought best to um, target this, um, this type of community first and then explore uh, residential and industrial in the future. But currently we are looking at a requirement of 8% of our parking spaces to um, be for electric vehicles. So if you look at the chart below, this is what we are trying to use. So if you have say five to nine parking spaces, we, re we would require that one be available for an electric vehicle charging station. Um, and then it goes up um, as you see up the chain, and then if you have 201 and over, we re are requesting at least, requiring at least 8% of your spaces to be available for the um, electric vehicle, electric vehicles. But we, this has been shown to uh, encourage more public adoption. We are looking at some examples from Northern Colorado as well as um, San Francisco with their EV ready ordinances. And then, um, excuse me, just to make sure. And then I think 8% is the most that we've seen. So, um, but it's shown that also when you install these in before, uh, during construction, it reduces the upfront cost. And so um, we're also trying to show this from a cost perspective and, um, and more details we'll be sharing to come at the time. We're hoping to get this done within the fall of this year. And so just some other um, incentives and uh, that are going on from the private sector and utility sector. Um, Nissan currently has a $10,000 rebate for a 2016-2017 lease that was in partnership with uh, Clean Cities Georgia as well as Nissan, and that applies to um, Clean Cities Georgia stakeholders, which means if you are a resident for the state of Georgia, this rebate will apply for you. And it's um, for $29,000 to $30,000 um, at market price. And then that $10,000 rebate, you would take off, and then you also have the opportunity to apply the $7,500 federal tax credit, and that it's up to $7,500. And we will be discussing that more later in the presentation. But with that, we are, this, these Nissan leases are going around at least around $12,000 $12, to $13,000 new. And that has been extended to September 30th of this year. And so hopefully this will, um, we'll see more electric vehicles coming into the um, market. And as we do see that, um, we as the city of Atlanta want to make sure that we are being supportive with infrastructure as well as EV-friendly policies. And then on the utility side, our Georgia Power, which is our electric utility, has, currently has rebates. So you, we have a, uh, there's a $250 rebate for residential home charging stations. So if a resident decides to install one in their home, they'll get $250 back. $500 rebates for charging stations at commercial properties, which would include the multifamily housing. 
and then they also have a $200 rebate for businesses installing charging stations during construction. And so that is that EV ready um, policy. So we're hoping that with, um, as the city pushes this EV ready ordinance, we would also have a, they would, uh, resident, excuse me, property owners would be able to take advantage of that $200 rebate. And we have, we have a very close relationship with Georgia Power and uh, these rebate programs are still in, in effect throughout this year. And um, they have been very successful, so there's no, um, nothing saying that they're trying to end it in the next few years. But um, so with all this happening, not just from um, the government perspective, the private sector and our utilities, we're, the city of Atlanta is trying to figure out what can we do, um, starting with this ordinance, but other means to uh, be more friendly to EV policy, especially as we have um, a, about 20,000 of these vehicles within the metro area that funnel into the city. And so um, with that, I'm going to um, let Ann uh, give you a overview from what the state is doing so that um, so you'll get to another level. So. Great. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, I'm going to highlight for you a little historical view on the story of Georgia. I get asked across the country, you know, what, what happened in Georgia? What is the story? You all were on top, kind of unusually on top in terms of your EV leadership. What is the story there? Well, These were the headlines we were seeing just a couple of years ago in 2015. Georgia was ranked as the number one market for the Nissan LEAF, and we were ranked second in the nation for the number of EVs registered just behind California. At the peak, Georgia was selling nearly uh, 1,500 vehicles a month, and we became one of the fastest growing markets in the U.S. So how or why did this happen? Well, first, in early 2000s, an electric vehicle tax credit, which was called the Zero Emissions Vehicle Tax Credit, or the ZEV tax credit, was passed. Uh, it was originally just a few thousand dollars, and then it was increased in the early 2000s to $5,000. The tax credit is available to be taken over five years and was eligible to uh, be taken on both the purchase and the lease of vehicles. And so there were three things that made this really work in Georgia. Atlantans, in particular, drive a lot. The tax credit was on the books when the Nissan LEAF was first introduced in 2011. So the tax credit went unused for nearly 10 years. And not only that, but it was a very generous tax credit. At $5,000, it was the second highest tax credit across the country. The only other state that had a higher one uh, was Colorado. And it could be applied, as I mentioned, to both purchases and leases. So this is a pretty old graphic, but I think it's a great one in terms of illustrating the impact of that tax credit on electric car sales. During the time period between 2011 when the Nissan LEAF first came out and 2015, electric car sales skyrocketed. And in a single year, from March 2013 to March 2014, there was a 614% growth in EVs. And during that whole time, Georgia drivers bought more than 20,000 EVs. But with this growth brought a lot of angst among legislators. The state was distributing millions of dollars annually, and this raised um, their attention, and folks wanted to take a look at it and, and see what the impact was to Georgia and if, if some changes needed to be made now that EVs were truly available across the state. So here's a little historical view. Uh, around the time of 2013-2014, Representative Chuck Martin, um, in Georgia proposed repeal of the tax credit. Uh, fortunately, though, um, a, a coalition of groups worked together and were able to hold off repeal for a couple of years. Some of the concerns that a lot of the legislators were expressing 
uh, were that the tax credit was primarily for progressives, for the rich, it was a Tesla tax credit, and then on the other hand, it was a Nissan incentive, and that the state was giving away cars, and that just wasn't fair to everyone. Um, and at EVs, not only was that the case, but also they thought that EVs um, should pay their fair share of the impact on the road, now that there were some 20,000 uh, vehicles on the road. Um, and as I mentioned, fortunately, we were able to hold that off for a couple years. And then in 2015, uh, Chuck Martin again proposed a bill to repeal the credit. At the same time, uh, Georgia was working very hard on a new transportation bill for the state, and this was House Bill 170. And this bill was a big priority for the governor to get it passed. Um, but throughout the process of uh, the bill, the elimination of the tax credit got added. In addition to the tax credit being zeroed out as a part of that bill, a new $200 user fee was also added. So EV drivers would now have to pay uh, a user fee uh, if they owned an all battery electric uh, vehicle. It did not solely apply to the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, but to battery electric ones. Unfortunately, uh, this was not an issue that many, because it was such a small component of this larger bill, it wasn't something that uh, many of our legislators really wanted to go to bat and risk their support for the transportation bill to get it changed. And so, um, as many of you know, Georgia's tax credit was repealed and a new $200 user fee was added. In the following year, uh, in 2016, however, uh, an alternative fuel study committee was passed to take a look at what the impact had been since the repeal of the tax credit. Uh, the study committee did meet four times um, across the state, but there was not a final hearing uh, report that was ultimately done and no uh, formal recommendations were ultimately adopted. Um, so we were disappointed not to see uh, additional action from, uh, from the General Assembly on this issue. Just this past year, um, a few new bills were introduced, one of which was House Bill 316, which would reduce the user fee uh, from $200 down to a lower amount of $100. Unfortunately, that was not heard either. Um, but this year was the first of a two-year session, so that, uh, that bill still is in play for next year. Additionally, um, at the end of the session, Representative Alan Peake um, held a subcommittee a Ways and Means Subcommittee hearing on uh, the opportunity for a new vehicle tax credit. Uh, the rate of that would be 2,500. It was a very good hearing, uh, but no action was taken on any EV bills. So this is a graphic showing what, what happened to EV sales with the loss of the tax credit. As you'll see, um, on the right-hand side in 2015, where the number of EVs, uh, EV sales dramatically plummeted, nearly 90% loss in EV sales with the repeal of the tax credit. This is another graphic demonstrating that drop. Uh, this is based on the RL Polk data. Um, and again, similar to the previous slide, it shows a significant drop-off in EV sales based on the loss of the tax credit. So as you can see, there's a direct connection between EV incentives that offered and EV sales. The other piece I want to highlight for you um, is the impact of user fees. Uh, the adoption of user fees is a growing trend across the country to make up for lost revenue of declining gas tax revenue. Unfortunately, this means that electric vehicles are getting double taxed. Not only do EV owners pay electricity taxes, but they are now having to pay these new user fees. And Georgia's user fee at $200 is the highest user fee in the country. 
Uh, other ones are in the $75 to $100 range, but we still believe that those are punitive. EVs, as you can see from this graphic done by Plug in America, still make up less than 2% of all vehicles on the road. So our legislators need to think more strategically about other methods to uh, make up for that lost gas tax revenue. So looking ahead, Georgia needs new EV policies that are supportive of growing EV markets, drive adoption in other parts of the state. As you can see from this slide, most of nearly 80% of EVs in Georgia are within five counties around Metro Atlanta. Uh, but fortunately, uh, this is the data from 2016. We're seeing some additional growth in the Savannah market uh, followed by Athens, Columbus, and the Macon areas. So there's huge potential to impact the rest of the state. And that is one of the key factors in moving forward with uh, legislation um, in Georgia, is how can we attract the interest of, uh, of folks in these other counties that have not yet benefited from the technology uh, nor the previous incentives offered by, um, by the state legislature. To, so to respond to some of these questions raised by legislators in the 2017 session that I mentioned to you earlier, Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, the City of Atlanta, and Plug in America commissioned a report by the Greenlink Group on the economic opportunities and impacts of new policies. We elected two options for consideration in the analysis, and I'd like to highlight a little bit from that report now. So as I mentioned, one of the key issues that legislators brought up is, you know, how is this benefiting other people in the state? So we, we elected uh, to look at the impacts of adding a new $2,500 tax credit. It would apply to both battery electric as well as plug-in hybrids. It would be limited to sales, uh, not leases, and one vehicle per person. There would be a cap and a five-year sunset on the bill. Also, uh, what would the impact of reduced user fee from $200 to $50 annually? What we found uh, from the analysis is that with the adoption of those policies, Georgia stands to benefit um, by increased income, nearly $54 million in increased income to the state, that's keeping the money in the state rather than sending it out for oil. Nearly 1,000 full-time jobs would be created and a $100 million gain in Georgia's GD people. And this would get people in the cars and they're able to use money for other purposes. So as we look ahead, the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy has launched a new campaign called Electrify the South. And we invite you to join this effort to, to stay on top of what's happening legislatively. Uh, you can go to electrifythesouth.org for more information and to sign up. So this concludes my presentation. Next, we have Natalia Swalnick with the Electrification Coalition. She has a decade of experience and knowledge in public policies issues related to transportation and energy. She manages the planning and execution of projects that support the accelerated adoption of plug-in electric vehicles and smart mobility for the Electrification Coalition. This work includes EV accelerator communities in Northern Colorado, Orlando, and Rochester. Previously, she spent six years as the Department of Energy Clean Cities Coordinator, and during her tenure there, the coalition displaced more than 22 million gallons of petroleum. She earned her Master's of Public Administration degree in 2007 from the University of Colorado at Denver and completed her bachelor's degree at Syracuse University. So welcome, Natalia. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to present to you all today and uh, look forward to sharing some information about what the Electrification Coalition is doing in terms of policy and deployment work across the country. So 
So in case you are not familiar with the Electrification Coalition, we are a nonpartisan, not-for-profit group of business leaders committed to promoting policies and actions that facilitate the deployment of electric vehicles on a mass scale. So that's really what's guiding all of the work that we do. Um, and so that feeds into uh, policy happening at the federal level. And um, so one thing I wanted to share with folks is information about our federal electric vehicle tax credit. And um, it's for relatively newer vehicles, uh, vehicles that entered the market after 12-31-09. And the base credit for all of the um, EV, EV vehicles is um, equal to $2,500. And then after that, for um, every vehicle, you're going to add $417 when you achieve a battery capacity of at least 5 kWh. So, um, there's an additional $417 available for each additional kWh above the five. And um, that maximum credit is going to top out at $7,500, so that's the ceiling, so uh, no vehicle will be eligible to, to go above that amount of funding. And um, this tax credit starts to phase out um, at 200,000 units sold per manufacturer. So if you take a look at um, the example tax credits uh, by vehicle for uh, model year 2017, you can see that there's a direct correlation, um, as I described, between the battery capacity and the, and the full credit that one can receive for the electric vehicle. So um, if you look, um, the, the smaller uh, battery size has a smaller associated tax credit. And then um, many of the larger vehicles, larger battery capacity vehicles, um, even though you're seeing a range from um, 16 kWh all the way up to 33, that tax credit, you know, you come up against that ceiling of $7,500. Um, so it's, it, it can be um, a, a bit of a complex tax formula. There, there is some math involved, but um, this is just an example sheet that helps quantify some of the, the more common vehicles on the market, um, although it's certainly not an all-inclusive list. Um, so you can get an idea of how the battery capacity plays into the amount of tax credit available. So um, I'm actually based in, in uh, the Denver, Colorado area, and we thought that it would be a good idea to share some information about the tax credits in Colorado so that you could get a sense of um, how they're structured here using um, a simpler tax uh, uh, equation. So what the tax credits are called here is the, the innovative, innovative Motor Vehicle Tax Credits. And um, although the tax credits are not new in Colorado, uh, we did pass a new bill, House Bill um, 1332 in, in the year 2016. And what this did is we created a fixed flat tax credit, which replaced a complicated calculation like the one that, that I just attempted to explain to you at the, at the federal level. And not only did it replace um, you know, a battery-based, math-based equation with something that's flat and relatively uncomplicated to determine, it also um, made the tax credits assignable to financing companies at the point of sale. So instead of purchasing a vehicle in August and then waiting um, until you filed your taxes then the following year um, and, and having to wait to redeem that credit, these um, are, again, available at the point of sale so the consumers are able to kind of get that instant gratification in, in, our, in an, our on-demand world um, that seems relatively popular. So um, the tax credits are available to both purchase and lease new vehicles um, and they came, this new uh, point of sale flat tax structure came into play um, at the beginning of this year, January 1st. And um, the legislation, unless it's you know, repealed, uh, will go through the end of the calendar year in 2021. So to give you a sense of how the tax credits are structured, um, there's, there's two ways that you can look at this. If you look at it across the top line, you can um, see that the tax credits are scheduled to uh, decrease over time until they are sunsetted entirely at the end of 2021. So when you look at the first three years of the applicable period for the legislation, 
you can see that light duty passenger vehicles are currently available uh, for a $5,000 tax credit. Um, so that goes for new purchase vehicles as well as vehicle conversions. And then when you um, are considering a leased vehicle, there is um, a smaller tax credit available there for $2,500. And then when you go out to the year 2020, they decrease down to $4,000 um, and $2,000 for new and leased vehicles uh, respectively. Um, and then in 2021, the final year that the tax credits are available, they decreased yet again to $2,500 and $1,500 uh, for the new and leased vehicles respectively. Um, and then if you look down um, at the different uh, sections of this chart, you can also see that um, they, the, the um, authors behind this tax credit legislation are looking to and kind of right size the incentives um, that are offered based on the size um, and, and the duty cycle of the vehicle class. So you can see that um, the light duty passenger vehicles are eligible for the smallest tax credits um, and then light, medium, and heavy duty are um, incentivized um, more heavily because those vehicles tend to, uh, tend, tend to have additional costs. The battery pack would likely be, be larger, et cetera. So uh, the Electrification Coalition is involved in tax policy, um, and we are actively tracking um, some of the tax policy that is uh, happening or, or rumored to be happening at the federal level, um, and it's um, you know something that um, we're we're looking into to see if those tax credits are going to be carried forward at the federal level or if there's talk um, about not continuing those on. And so we are uh, figuring out what our strategy is going to be should that occur. And um, if you're interested in working with us, my contact information is at the end of the presentation. And um, should that happen, um, we'll be moving forward on that and, and you know, look forward to uh, working with a larger coalition to make sure that those tax credits remain in place and, and, and continue to help incentivize the marketplace. But aside from policy, there are a lot of ways that um, greater numbers of electric vehicles can be deployed um, in communities. And so I wanted to uh, inform you about some of the work that we're doing through our EV accelerator communities. And we have them in northern Colorado, Orlando, Florida, and Rochester, New York. And what the Electrification Coalition does is we work in a concentrated geographic region and really work to attack the entire EV ecosystem at once. And so if you look at this slide, you can kind of see that there, there's a lot of ways to hit um, communities and, and make sure that stakeholders from across the spectrum are getting involved. So the EC is what the electrification, that's what we call ourselves, will do is work with employers, um, both private and public, in a market and help to um, get employers working on a workplace charging program um, and that can include um, information on how to install charging infrastructure to surveying workers to determine if there's a need, um, all the way to signage. Um, we also work on group by programs, which is a way of us working with um, OEMs and um, dealerships to offer vehicles for a discounted rate, um, capitalizing on the tax credits and other incentives that um, the automakers will, will put in place to help drive traffic to a particular dealership to help um, bring down the cost so it, for a set period of time so that it, um, there's an acceleration of vehicles sold in that area. The Electrification Coalition will also work to develop content for educational workshops um, or support uh, partners who, who wish to put on their own. Um, so that people can get information on the benefits of driving electric. And this can also include for fleets, um, making sure that the employees that are driving the fleet vehicles um, are excited about them, know what the vehicles can do, know how to charge them, um, and are really maximizing the benefit that these vehicles can have. As I touched on, we work on local policies and incentives. Um, we're also working with light duty TNC, um, which is you know your Uber, your Lyft, et cetera, taxi or, or public fleet electrification. So helping to get um, electric vehicles installed um, within these 
vehicle fleets that are already driving quite a bit of mileage, but you know, making the transition over to electric. Um, we also work with dealerships and OEMs to increase dealer inventory in a region. This is important because um, it's, it's really hard to be a leader in the um, electric vehicle market if um, someone only has a few EVs on their lot. Um, that doesn't really motivate dealer, uh, the, the sales folks to sell them, and um, it also, you know, doesn't send the message that you know we're we're open for business and we're selling electric vehicles. So we'll we'll help um, with that partnership and making sure that there's a there's a great deal of selection that are going to get drivers excited about about driving electric. The Drive Leadership Program is a way to get um, C-level um, executives into an electric vehicle. Um, with with um, kind of an extended test drive. So if you think of these last two things as, as working in tandem, drive leadership um, is a way to get someone behind the electric vehicle, uh, the, the wheel of an electric vehicle for about a week so they can learn, um, what, you know, get, get over the range anxiety so they can learn how to charge it, they can see how easy and convenient it is to charge at home. And the output of that would be that they could either choose an electric vehicle as a company perk um, if they, you know, get an, an executive vehicle. They could also um, begin working on a workplace charging program for, for others at their company, or perhaps they could put electric vehicles um, into their fleet so that uh, they can be used for, for company purposes. So um, just a close-up on that um, in our different communities. So Drive Electric Northern Colorado was the EC's flagship program. It was the first of its kind initiative, which was designed to achieve widespread adoption of EVs in the northern Colorado region. So the two cities that we worked with there were the city of Loveland and the city of Fort Collins. And um, the program was incredibly successful. Um, it, sales in that region have outpaced the national average by a factor of, of two to three times. Um, and we are currently engaged in this community, but have since transitioned primary ownership of the program over to the stakeholders in the region. Um, and they are working on, um, you know, they, they have a group of EV enthusiasts that are working on events for National Drive Electric Week. They are working on ride and drive events. They, they hold monthly enthusiast meetings. And then the cities in that region um, have electric vehicles in their fleet, and they continue to manage electric vehicle ambassador programs for their, for their team. Drive Electric Orlando is a bit different, but um, same, same theme. And what we're trying to do there is, leveraging, is to leverage um, our top tourism destination in the country and the rental car market as an opportunity to, opportunity to expose the millions of visitors to Orlando every year to electric vehicles, turning renters into buy, buyers. And um, this is done by promoting electric vehicles as a rental option to folks uh, renting through Enterprise. Um, and this has um, results in some really high exposure numbers. Um, even if customers do not actually rent an electric vehicle, more than 60 million visitors to the rental car site through the duration of the program have seen that electric vehicles are here, they're, they're part of this fleet, and you can get one when you go to Orlando. And um, they have charging at 35 hotels locally in theme parks as well, which results in some premier parking. And if you've ever been to any of these attractions, you know that um, uh, the parking situation can, can be half the battle. And so uh, electric vehicles uh, get, get perks such as, as parking closer and um, other experiences that, that money's, money can't buy um, by visiting the Epcot test track and uh, getting the clear pass and um, really selling the entire experience as kind of uh, these uh, electric vehicle perks. And the Rochester EV Accelerator is our uh, newest community that we're involved in. So our vision there is to create a model that's both scalable and replicable to other areas by attacking this EV ecosystem. And uh, by way of that, we're strengthening the regional economy decreasing dependence on oil while also improving the environment. And um, the partners that we're working with there are um, NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy Office, um, the local Clean Cities chapter, which is the Genesee Region Clean Communities, the City of Rochester, and then Energetics Incorporated. And um, our mission there is to partner to drive, to drive rapid adoption of EVs to leading levels among mainstream communities and industry throughout the Rochester, New York region. 
So with that, I will uh, transition um, ownership back over to Anne to uh, take uh, to summarize the presentation and, and handle questions. Great, thank you so much, Natalia. So at this time, we are opening it up for questions. So if you have a question, please um, go to the right-hand side of your screen and you can enter that question and we'll be responding to those in the order in which they are received. Uh, the first uh, question, which I believe most uh, participants have uh, seen a response to is, will this presentation be sent out after the WebEx? And yes, and there will be a recording that is available um, to you all to, to listen to at another time or share with folks who may be interested in listening. Are there any other questions? All right, um, so we're going to start. What are the perceived roles of utilities like Georgia Power and cities in the recent Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Trust? So to respond to that, um, I think there's a role for uh, utilities and um, a significant role, in fact, in deploying electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, as you may be aware, there are two, uh, well, there's really three primary programs of the Volkswagen Settlement and, and two that are particularly relevant to deploying both electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, one is Appendix C, which is a zero emissions um, program that uh, Volkswagen will actually be distributing and they will be installing charging infrastructure. Um, they have selected the recipients of their first 30-month cycle of funding for that program. And then there's another component of that, which is Appendix D, which is the Environmental Mitigation Trust Program, which you reference. Um, each state um, is eligible to receive funds through that program. And this, if the state elects to receive that money, um, the governor needs to indicate that, that the state will receive that money and then the state will develop a plan of how it intends to use that money. Um, utilities have an opportunity to uh, weigh in on those plans as do uh, any other organizations or groups. Um, and each state, um, most states in the southeast now have some um, some forum, uh, either through the, the environmental uh, department in their state or through a planning agency, for example, in, in Georgia, the Office of Planning and Budget is taking comments and input of how the state should develop their plans. So there is an opportunity uh, for uh, utilities to engage in that program, um, as well as for the other, uh, for the Appendix C funding, they can they can propose project ideas for that as well. Hope that answers your question. Uh, feel free to follow up with me if you have additional questions. That can always be reached at ann at cleanenergy.org. Does anyone else on the panel uh, have any other response to that question? All right, uh, second question. Have there been any incentives for uh, solar installations? Um, I don't know if that directly implies to maybe char uh, solar charging infrastructure, um, and there are uh, various incentives across the, the, the country for that. Uh, for this webinar, I don't have the direct answer at this time, but I'm certainly willing to follow up with you um, on that to get the specific information that you're looking for. And um, this is Natalia. I'd also like to say to the attendees um, that there have been some successful what we call power purchase programs. So I talked briefly about the electric vehicle group buy that we organize in certain communities. Um, we published um, a handbook uh, with the Colorado Energy Office and, and SWEEP, which is the Southwest um, Energy Efficiency Partnership. 
Um, and this is about a year, year and a half ago, and it actually has details on how you can pair these two, part, uh, these two programs together so that you can incentivize rooftop solar and electric vehicles at the same time. And um, if, if anybody would like to follow up with me, um, I'd be happy to distribute that. Great, thank you, Natalia. Another question, can you elaborate on the EV projects in Savannah and what plans are in the pipeline to expand the program? Um, I'll take a stab at that uh, and any other panelists uh, if you have additional information. I know uh, the only thing that I'm familiar with in terms of programs that Savannah is doing is that there is uh, Georgia Power, uh, ChargePoint and several of the um, other companies that install charging infrastructure have deployed charging infrastructure around the city. I'm not currently aware of existing formal programs that the city has adopted um, or any plans to expand that, uh, although I think there is enormous potential to get um, expanded programs uh, in Savannah due to uh, them ha having a high number of EVs uh, in the city. Another question, is there a solar PV install component of Electrify the South? Uh, for that campaign, it is primarily focused on transportation, but of course, uh, increasing the benefits of EVs, making EVs cleaner will require increased uh, renewable energy deployment and Southern Alliance for Clean Energy does have a program um, that is focused on expanding solar throughout the Southeast. Um, and so those two programs sort of you know, work together, but there's not uh, an, an overall uh, PV component of Electrify the South campaign. All right, next question. Have there been any efforts to promote EVs through city county comprehensive plan policies other than tax incentives. There, there have been a, a few examples of that around the country in which cities and counties have adopted goals for um, the number of EVs that they would like to see um, adopted by a certain time frame. Uh, Justin or Natalia may want to share some of those other examples. Yeah, uh, and I can uh, speak to that. So um, from the city of Atlanta's perspective, um, I would believe it was last fall we made a commitment for the city fleet to have uh, 600 EVs by the end of 2020. And so, um, that, and that's more on the um, our, our fleet side, but in regards to uh, actual the, pub, the public, we do host ride and drives, so we did have one um, last year, last October, for our city employees, and um, we actually had some of our employees buy electric vehicles um, after that program. And then um, we do participate in the National Drive Electric Week, and we're all and we're in process of planning another ride and drive at our um, at the airport at um, Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, in partnership with Georgia Power, to. Um, showcase more of that. Um, we've been told, we've seen and we've been told that getting butts in seats is the best way to kind of expose people to electric vehicles. And then um, another program that the City of Atlanta is currently trying to flesh out, we're in talking with some nonprofit partners right now, is developing an EV car share program on our west and south side of our city to encourage more electric vehicles and charging stations on that side. We want to expose the, um, the rest of the city to this, um, as this, emer to this emerging technology, especially as it's, um, more models are coming out in the, new, in the few years. So as we do push this out for our own fleet, we are trying to figure out ways that we can do this from an education and awareness standpoint. I would also add um, that um, through the Smart Columbus program. Um, the Columbus Partnership is working to increase EV market adoption in Columbus and the surrounding um, seven county region to 1.8% uh, uh, by the end of their three-year grant period. And that's going to represent a 486% increase from their 2015 baseline. 
Um, and that's that's part of what they're doing through the Smart um, City Challenge. Where they were the winner through the U.S. DOT for, uh, funding. Thank you. Uh, next question is about um, development of electric vehicle um, icing ordinances. And for those who may not be familiar with uh, what that term is, icing basically refers to internal combustion engine, engines. Um, one of the big problems is oftentimes uh, at, at, at charging stations, um, internal combustion engines or regular gasoline or diesel cars will park in that space. And it's a big issue in terms of um, relieving folks' range anxiety and allowing access for folks to charge their car where they need it. So I think ordinances are one option for doing that, but there remains a challenge with uh, identifying appropriate enforcement, enforcement mechanisms for doing that. And uh, that's another issue that I think cities are really at um, uh, just the very beginnings of figuring out how to most effectively uh, develop enforcement pro programs. Anybody else have a comment on that question as well? Uh, the city of Atlanta will, we're going to try to uh, look at that as well, but our uh, parking, it's a, it's a different situation here where we have property owners that own their own parking, and then we have another entity known as Park Atlanta, or Park Atlanta that um, oversees uh, the uh, enforcement of our parking. So we're trying to figure out, as we do, because we will need to address um, icing is what's going to be the proper and appropriate uh, enforcement mechanism to make sure that we are addressing that. So um, more to come as we uh, develop the best route. Thanks, Justin. Uh, next question. Um, given the inherent benefit for EVs to become automated, what are states or safe doing to assist with providing a clear path to approve federal and state regulations. Uh, this is a very large issue and we are just beginning to look at what the impacts of that will be in Georgia. There were several several bills um, this year proposed that would address uh, access of autonomous vehicles to be tested on Georgia roads as well as other uh, factors. And we're tracking those issues, but we have yet to engage uh, directly in any of those fights uh, yet. But um, I think that's something that um, we're looking to figure out what the best role uh, could be for us in that in that issue. And I would um, just add that the Electrification Coalition is definitely considering, um, you know, autonomous vehicles as part of you know th this advanced technology class of vehicles and figuring out how autonomous and um, electric um, interact, making sure that they're connected and automated. It's, it's, it's really this whole package. And um, we are also working to avoid really patchwork legislation, um, uh, you know, in, in municipalities and states um, so that uh, they can be tested and, you know, uh, figuring out what the lessons learned and what the advantages and disadvantages are going to be. Um, consistently um, across the country. So, and we're also, um, the EC is also working on our strategic plan here coming up at the end of the summer, and I know this is going to be a huge piece of, of what we'll be looking at in the future. Thanks. Uh, next question um, I, I need some clarification on, so if I could ask you to rewrite the question. Uh, there was a question uh, about port expansion. If you uh, could elaborate specifically on that question, uh, we'd be happy to answer it. Uh, next question is, are any of you studying the implications for the electric grid of increased electricity demand as EVs catch on? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely yes, and our uh, utility reform team uh, is, our, is looking at those issues as well as um, our Electrify the South team. Um, it will be an increased um, opportunity for utilities, but also a new challenge in terms of figuring out how to um, uh, 
how to uh, impact, uh, how it will impact some of their uh, planning uh, and rates and other factors. They, um, many of the utilities in the Southeast are beginning to look at that issue and how they should engage uh, in charging infrastructure as well as, uh, you know, recovery of costs associated with that. And um, of course, the impacts to the grid but um, there's a lot of opportunities. For example, in Georgia, there is a time of use rate um, to help um, balance the load of EVs and incentivizing charging at night, as opposed to during um, peak hours during the, the late afternoons. Uh, so we are, are doing that. Um, do others want to comment on that as well? Oh man, I can give a... Uh the city of Atlanta perspective with um, in early May, our city council unanimously adopted a 100% clean energy goal for by 2025, it would be city operations. And then by 2035, it would be all city buildings within the limits. And so as we look at um, adding the clean energy, we're looking at ways that we can incorporate electric vehicles in there to assist with that, uh, with that supply and demand of energy. And we're working closely with Georgia Power, who is our electric utility. They're, all, they're over the entire city of Atlanta uh, to figure out what, the, um, what that's going to look like. And so um, that's still being flushed out and uh, hopefully we'll have some more information on that towards the end of the year. Thank you. Another question uh, for you, Justin, uh, uh, Natalia as well. What are the top two or three things a small city can do to in incentivize EV purchases? You know, I think top is, is kind of relative in a matter of, of opinion, but I definitely know that there are, are things that a small uh, municipality can do. Um, it just depends on, you know, the political will, um, what, what's realistic um, and, you know, what policies and procedures are already in place to either, you know, help or, or inhibit the policy. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, there's, there's really small things that could be done um, at, at the local level. Um, it could be setting a minimum amount of um, EV parking spaces per number of new parking spaces added. So you could make it where for every 25 parking spots that are added, one has to um, have electric vehicles charging. Or, and you can do that on any scale. I just used 25 as an example. Um, some other things that are heavier lifts but are being done um, in municipalities of all sizes are um, requiring uh, or updating building codes so that um, you know, new, new building stock has to be, be pre-wired to accommodate electric vehicles, even if the charging stations aren't necessarily in, installed. Um, they could also be, um, you know, kind of a, a less formal program where um, electric vehicles park for free on Fridays or, or something like that at a, at a parking meter. So I think that there's, there's a lot of things that can be done. They're probably too numerous to list. But um, if you'd like to follow up with me at the end, I, could, I would definitely be happy to share some information um, that the EC has on ways that municipalities can incentivize electric vehicles without, um, you know, having to go, you know, there, there's smaller things that can be done without having to go through a city council or like a mayoral signing. Um, and then there's also, again, those big things that can be done that are really going to send a message. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Natalia that it will vary from city to city. Uh, from Atlanta's standpoint, we've noticed that the, ed the education piece is uh, has been very effective. So um, if your city does begin to start saying purchasing electric vehicles for your own fleet, just continuing that education, um, if you use the vehicles for community outreach, um, that tends to be very helpful. And then even your employees, as they drive these for uh, city use, they might even look at purchasing for their own use. And, um, and they could kind of be your um, pioneers for your city. Thank you. And um, we are going to take one more question. Um, we're going to uh, do our final wrap up. Uh, the question is, how do we deal with garage orphans? P 
people without garages in urban cities? Uh, I think this goes to, a, you know, a multifamily housing uh, question. Does anyone want to respond to that? Um, I, I guess we oh, oh, go, go ahead, Natalia. No, just I'll defer to you. Go ahead. You you you're in a municipality. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from the city of Atlanta standpoint, we are that's what we're targeting the multifamily housing as the um, biggest because they're going to have some type of parking. Usually, I believe it's like one space per um, per unit, and so to, to figure out. That, and that's kind of where that EV ready ordinance comes in to make sure that um, we can do that. And we're also identifying on street parking. That's another um, aspect that we can do. Uh, actually, at um, Atlanta City Hall on either side, we have uh, two charging spaces. They're a donation by, um, by the Atlanta Falcons. And um, so, uh, looking at ways so we can incorporate more on street parking. Uh, multifamily, and then um, so that's kind of how we're trying to uh, encourage more of that, especially as more um, more multifamilies being built here into the city. Thank you, Justin. Um, there there are a few other questions that we have not been able to get to today. Um, what I will plan to do is follow up uh, with uh, those folks. Uh, to respond to the questions, um, but also feel free to email me directly and I'll do my best to uh, answer the question or find out the answer for you. Uh, feel free to email me at ann, a -N -N -E, at cleanenergy.org. And I want to thank everyone again for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. I thought they were great. Uh, today's presentation has been recorded and will be available on the webinar archive page of cleanenergy.org. We'll also send you a link to that recording once it has been processed. Sometimes that, that can take a few days, so please be patient. And if you enjoyed today's presentation, please consider joining SAFE, EV Club of the South, or the Electrification Coalition, or all three, so that we can continue our work towards clean energy solutions in the Southeast and across the country. I uh, thank everyone again for uh, joining us today, and don't forget to check out electrifythesouth.org. Thank you.